Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagements at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Friday, May 19th, 2023. It is a very exciting day because we have a very exciting guest that I'm very excited about coming on the podcast. But first, I want to introduce someone who I'm always excited to have on Short Circuit, and that is my colleague, Sam Gedge. Sam, welcome back. Thank you, Anthony. Now, Sam is going to be talking about footnote four later in the show. No, not that footnote four, the footnote four from the Caroline Products case from 1938. No, this is a different footnote four. There's actually been a lot of footnote fours over the years. They seem to slip in the important stuff in the fourth footnote, I guess. But um, we'll be talking about that later in the show. First, though, we have on my co-clerk from my clerking days at the Supreme Court of Montana. I have alluded to him uh, e earlier in uh, other podcasts, uh, but here he is for real. He is a Montana native, uh, graduate of Stanford University School of Law. He worked at the Department of Justice for a while. Now he has his own practice and he's a member of this group called Citizens for Constitutional Integrity. And he has this amazing case that you may not agree with on the merits, but it has like layers and layers and layers about what he's doing in court, how he's appealing, all kinds of good stuff that is going to be very exciting to talk about. And it's a it concerns kind of the middle part of the 14th Amendment, which is very much in the news these days. So they have. Right. You have Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which is equal protection, due process, the privileges or immunities clause that we like talking about at IJ. Like That's the famous part. Then there's Section 5, which is Congress enforcing the law, which you hear about, too. And then there's all this stuff in the middle, which no one was talking about at all until just the last few years, because Section 4, right, that's the one about the debt of the United States that some – Zany people think, you know, means that you don't need Congress for issuing new, new debt, the debt ceiling. There's Section 3, which is about insurrection. We've heard all kinds of stuff about that since January 6, 2021. But then there's Section 2, which is about apportionment. And we're going to be talking a lot about apportionment with Jared Petnado, my old friend from Montana. So, Jared, welcome to Short Circuit. Thanks for having me, Anthony. I'm a longtime listener, and so I appreciate you having me on. Yes. Um, well, we we're, we're appreciate you calling in today. So, uh, Jared, we got a lot we can talk about, but I think maybe set the stage with, you know, the the problem you're trying to address and how you have gotten your clients into court, and you know what's happened in the case so far. Uh, long story short, for the listeners, there's a recent ruling from a three-judge, special three-judge panel um, on the case, on standing, that you are now appealing, but there's a lot more to the case than that. So take it away. Absolutely. Thanks, Anthony. And I appreciate coming here on an Institute for Justice podcast, especially because the idea for this lawsuit originated from my listening to Bound by Oath, episode, uh, season one, episode two, I found that was talking about section two of the 14th amendment that taught in that section, no one's ever really been able to use it since the framers passed framers proposed it and uh, the States ratified it in the 1860s. So the, this all comes about today from a lot of the voting denials and abridgments that we're seeing throughout the United States. I think everyone's pretty familiar with that. The president has talked about it. It's uh, that's news. So then the question arises under the 14th Amendment, Section 2, whether those count as denials or abridgments that trigger that section. So I looked a little bit deeper and my administrative law background showed me that there might be a case that can arise from this because the 14th Amendment, just to back up, you know, where does it come from? It's the, we're right after the Civil War. The states are in the process of ratifying the 13th Amendment. And that's the amendment, of course, that freed the enslaved peoples. So while Congress is, is, is thinking about this, and you know, this is right after 
the uh, Congress leaves session in March 1865. Appomattox happens April 8th, 1865. That's where General Lee surrendered to, uh, to Ulysses S. Grant. And then we have President Lincoln killed a week after that, April 15th, 1865. Congress doesn't come back into session until December 1865 because of the weird ways the Constitution was working and when it started again. So at that point, they're realizing, oh my goodness, we have now freed these enslaved people in the South. So the Southern states are going to count them no longer under the original Constitution as three-fifths of a person. They're going to start counting them as five-fifths of a person. And we know those Southerners are not going to let those formerly enslaved people vote. So we have basically given the South 13 extra seats in the U.S. House of Representatives as a reward for starting the Civil War. And they are not into that. They think that's not maybe the best result from the Civil War. So they said, well, what are we going to do? They looked at various options of apportionment, and they realized that this was a really fundamental thing that they were talking about, about how in a representative democracy you count the people and who gets to represent who in government. So they thought, well, maybe we should do it on voters. But it turns out if you do it on voters, you've got the same number of, you know, basically men in California as you do in Vermont. But there's no, there aren't as many women and children in California. So it really skews the population impact. So they looked at a bunch of different, everybody had gone west, of course, to California to start their fortunes and find gold. So they looked at a bunch of different ways to tinker with this. And they came up with a very sophisticated formula. And what it says is that to the, and, and then you got to modify it to bring it forth in time. We got to modify it with the 19th Amendment that allowed women to vote. And then we got to modify it a little bit with the, I think it's the 26th Amendment that allowed, uh, 24th Amendment, that allowed uh, people at the age of 18 or 26, to vote. I believe, yeah. 26, thank you. So when you modify it with those two pieces, then you, you get a formula that says, all right, so to the extent that you allow eligible citizens, resident citizens in your state to vote, we're going to count that percentage of your population when we divvy up seats in the U.S. House. In other words, if you are, if it's 1870, you're North Carolina, you're two thirds white and one third black people, and you don't let black people vote, we're only counting two thirds of your population when we divvy up seats. So that is what we're bringing forward. And then when you look at the number of people disenfranchised today who can't vote for one reason or another, then it, it leads to a lot of interesting questions about how to implement the 14th Amendment Section 2. And the Census Bureau has basically at this point never done that because in 1870, which was the first census after the 14th Amendment was ratified by the states, they didn't have the data. They couldn't figure out whose voting right was denied, whose was abridged. They couldn't figure out who were citizens in all the different places. So they didn't have good data. They couldn't do it then. But now we got lots of data. And the Census Bureau still doesn't want to actually implement this and actually go out and figure out whose voting rights are denied and abridged according to, you know, what, what that means. And so they've never implemented that. So we brought this lawsuit in uh, DDC, the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, to enforce that on behalf of citizens in states whose voting rights were, have, uh, whose states lost citizens in the apportionment of 2020. So some states, you know, when you take out, we have 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, you divvy them up among the states. And as population kind of shifts around and grows uh, unevenly across the country, then you got to move some seats. So we have plaintiffs from, for example, New York, which lost a seat by 86 people on the census. We've got a, uh, one of our client, one of our members is from Pennsylvania, and they lost a seat in in the census. And then we have members from Virginia and uh, they, they actually didn't lose a seat, but there's possibilities that they could have gained one if the Census Bureau had actually implemented the 14th Amendment Section 2. So we've, we're coming at this from a lot of different directions and we're saying Census Bureau, you know, this is the Constitution. It's a procedure that you have to undertake and you need to go forth and, and do this and, and implement the Constitution. And so, and so it's a pretty basic. And so... So the people people get get a general understanding then that there are you are alleging there are states where there has been abridgment of the right to vote. Um, you know whether people agree with your allegation or not, you can get the understanding that okay, if a state abridges the right to vote for 
certain people, then that should lower the their kind of for, formula of how many how many seats they get. And so a state might. And one one you talk about is Wisconsin. So Wisconsin, I think they have nine seats now, right? And so it could be that they go down to eight and that that seat would maybe go to New York or go to Pennsylvania or, or what have you. And then that, that of course, might be true in other states with similar types of restrictions. Um, and so at the end of the day, your, your clients would therefore have increased voting representation in the state. And that's kind of, that's how they would have standing, right? Is that they would then, they would, their state would have more, uh, uh, more representation, not just in, in Congress, but also an, an extra electoral college vote, right? Correct. As long as there's a chance that they could get another seat, that's, that's going to be enough. And when you look at Wisconsin, just to, if I could flesh that out a little yeah. more, Anthony, we have, uh, that has, the, I think, still the most draconian photo voter ID laws in the United States. And a district judge held a two-week trial back in, I think it was 2010, 2011, over these, uh, these requirements. And he found that the photo voter ID laws in Wisconsin disenfranchised 300,000 already registered citizens. So these people, these 300,000 people were registered to vote. And when the photo voter ID law passed, they could no longer vote. So they had passed all of the hurdles that they needed to do, and then the state erected more. And so to say that that's not some kind of abridgment of the right to vote when you can vote one day and then the next day you can't, I think is a is a pretty a pretty uh, pretty long stretch for that interpretation. Now, before we go further, so, I I can't hear listeners say a little skeptical of that finding uh, of that judge, and, and we don't go, need to go into like voter ID issues uh, too deep today. But just so we can, but like, just so I can ask their question, they're probably asking of those 300,000 people, was it that like they were not able to vote again in the future? Or was it that like they missed a cycle because they didn't realize they had to re register? Or because I, m some people might find it hard to believe that they, they like could not vote in the future, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. So, the, it was an additional barrier, an additional hurdle. So those 300,000 people, you know, on, on day one uh, could vote. But then day two, they had to go out and get the right ID. And it was only a, a finite number of IDs that they could use. So they couldn't use, for example, their uh, power bill. Some states will let you use your power right. bill. They couldn't use um, their... Uh, I forget all the different IDs. I don't, I don't know if they could use their passport. I forget the, the various ways. It had to be an unexpired ID. So if you have a driver's license that is, un, that is expired, then they couldn't use that either. So they could overcome the hurdles. But those can be difficult for, for right. people of limited means and limited time. Right. So, so then you, so you make these allegations, but you don't do what you know, most plaintiff's lawyers do when they go to the courthouse, file a complaint... Uh, get, get a motion to dismiss, go to discovery. You had this this other way of going about things, which is why you had this this three judge panel, right? So explain like how that process worked. Yeah, three judge courts in federal court are pretty rare these days. They used to be a lot more common. It used to be whenever you brought a claim that a law that Congress had passed was unconstitutional, that you had jurisdiction in a three judge court. And then you would have the right of appeal, direct appeal, to the U.S. Supreme Court. So we've actually seen a lot of the Supreme Court decisions from the 50s and 60s and 70s that, were, that arose from three-judge courts. And when you go back and read some of them, you might see a little more of this happening. And by the 80s, the Supreme Court was, uh, was crying uncle to Congress and said, we, we can't take all of this, guys. Can you uh, decrease our workload a little bit? Can you try to figure out a different way so that we can not have to deal with all of these direct appeals. And so Congress did pass a, a statute that cut back on three judge courts in some very significant ways, but they left three judge courts in existence for a few purposes. One of which is uh, when you bring a claim, you a plaintiff bring a claim alleging an unconstitutional apportionment and apportionment of course, is the process for distributing us house seats, also distributing seats in within states. 
So it applies for both uh, congressional apportionment and for intrastate apportionment. And there's a second statute here in particular where you allege that the Census Bureau used an, uh, a flawed statistical method for apportioning seats or for counting representatives that you also have a right to a three judge court. And that and in both cases, you can you have a right of appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. And are there prior examples of someone using that system for specifically in the census for the apportionment? Uh Yes. So you, the state of Utah used the original three judge court. Oh, no, I'm sorry. They used the new one, actually. The state of Utah used that in a 2002 U.S. Supreme Court decision. And the state of Montana used the three judge court rule back in 1992. And the state of Massachusetts. Right, that's when they lost a seat, right? Yeah. Yeah. And they wanted it back using a different <laughs> apportionment method, mathematical way of distributing the seats, right? So I appreciate, I just want to add, I appreciate, I know this is short circuit. I appreciate you guys slumming down with me in the district courts. <laughs> well, it's three judges. So it looks like, I mean, that's the quote that it looks like um, a circuit court. And then it, it of the judges on your panel, two actually are DC circuit court, appellate court judges. So how does that process, like, like how do the, the judges get chosen? Is it nationwide? Is it just like DC district court and DC appellate court they're, they're drawn from? It's, uh, it only can come from the circuit and the district. Okay. So the, well, you gotta, you gotta be careful when, if you're a plaintiff filing these cases, because you need to file your, uh, petition for a three judge court in DDC, uh, in the district of Columbia, uh, district court, the local rule says you need to file it along with your petition, like on the same day or like right, you know, right at the time. And if you blow that deadline, you could lose your right to a three judge court just by not following the procedures. So under the statute, if you just allege these claims, allege uh, apportionment or, uh, you know, malapportionment in this case, then the, it, it, the district court automatically assigns it to some district judge based on, we call it the wheel, random assignment. And then the chief, once he certifies it as a three judge court, which he's supposed to do based solely on the allegations, not, not actually looking at the substance of it, then the petition goes to the chief judge of the circuit court. And he assigns two more judges, one of which has to come from the appellate court itself, from the DC circuit here. I see. And here, uh, here the judge Srinivasan had assigned uh, Judge Walker from the appellate court, and then also Judge Pan, who was at that point on the district court. So then later, President Biden appointed her to the circuit court. Oh, I see. So she got elevated. So that's how we actually ended up with two appellate judges. And she didn't uh, get off the case. I don't know if she could have if she'd wanted, but she didn't. <laughs> oh, interesting. So, um, and then, then there is no discovery. And is that because it's, and an, an Administrative Procedure Act case, or is that some other wrinkle? That's the administrative law side, okay. definitely. So we have a lot of documents from the Census Bureau that they put up online. And then we sent a letter to the Census Bureau. We said, hey, guys, uh, we need you to, do, you know, when you did the 2020 census, turns out you forgot about the 14th Amendment Section <laughs> 2. Can you guys go do that for us, please? And they said, oh, I'm sorry. We're the Census Bureau. We just count things. If you want justice, there's a whole department of justice across the street. So, you know, <laughs> he said, oh, OK, we, we know what that means. So we sued the Census Bureau and the Commerce Department and, and some officials. So under the APA, you, you don't get discovery. Usually the judges have to determine the case based upon the evidence that was in front of the agency itself at the time it made its decision. And it has to determine whether that decision was lawful or arbitrary and capricious. So the agency itself, in a normal a APA case, administrative law case, has to go out and compile the administrative record. These are all the documents that we looked at when we were considering this question and making this decision. And then they put it in a package and bait stamp it and send it to the court. Here, you know, we didn't need all that. It's pretty clear that they didn't do what we asked. And we had all their math because they put it on the internet. So we said, we don't really need all the administrative law. 
We don't need the whole administrative record. We got the documents, so we just want our summary judgment here. Can you please get that to us, Your Honors? And under this uh, rule in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, you can file summary judgment at any time up until uh, a deadline you know, before uh, discovery closes, I think is where that line is. And so you you get all that in and then tell us how oral argument and the uh, the opinion went. Right. We So we moved for summary judgment. The Census Bureau and the Department of Commerce moved to dismiss. And they said, you don't have injury. You haven't proven injury. And they said, you don't have an administrative law claim because uh, the Supreme Court threw that out in 1992. And also, you don't have a writ of mandamus claim because, uh, you know, that's too specific and your claims are too general, basically. It requires more specificity, specificity than you have um, than you have pled. So we get to oral argument, which was set months out. On the other side of Judge Pan's confirmation, I think is part of the plan of, of <laughs> setting that so far out. I don't think she wanted to be on record on this case before she had to go talk to all the senators and, uh, and explain her positions on things. So we had that in December of last year. And when we got in there, the judges had lots of questions. They uh, were trying their best to, to figure out all these pieces. It was a, a pretty, we would call it a hot bench. And there were um, a lot of sentences that I didn't get to finish because more <laughs> questions kept coming. And, I, and it, was a, it was pretty intense. So when we finally got the decision, the judges uh, decided that we didn't have standing and, and that's a Article Three principle. You have to prove injury that the action actually that you're challenging, like caused that injury or is fairly traceable to that injury, and that there's still something that the judges can do about it. Redressability. So they said, you know, you uh, what about this injury thing? And 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 we argued, well, we lost seats because of the census, because of the apportionment, and that's what we're challenging. And they said, well all right, we hear you, but you need to prove that if the Census Bureau did the uh, process that you want, the 14th Amendment Section 2 process, that it would cure your injury. And you gave us a declaration, you have this expert who came in and, and reapportioned the seats and did all this math, but we, you know, we don't think your math is ultimately proving what you want to prove because the Census Bureau is going to go do a lot more and you haven't done all of these things that the Census Bureau has gone and done to make sure that you have proven injury. And then we said, well, really, this is a procedural injury claim because we're entitled to this procedure. The 14th Amendment Section 2 sets out a procedure. We get the procedure as long as there is some possibility that the procedure could help us. And they said, oh, well, it turns out that procedural injuries only matter if you have a right to participate in the procedure. And uh, I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly where that comes from. <laughs> That's a lot of the basis for our appeal. Yeah. And then you appeal. So we'll, we'll ask you about that in a moment. But uh, you appeal to, I understand, instead of the Supreme Court, like you would with one of these, quote, normal three judge panels, um, you go to the D.C. Circuit because it's a standing issue. Yeah. Uh, if there is jurisdiction in the Supreme Court for an appeal, you have to go to the Supreme Court to take it. Uh -huh. But because the district court here uh, tossed our lawsuit based on Article 3 standing, based on the Constitution, that's not, uh, we don't have jurisdiction in the Supreme Court to appeal that decision. So we are planning to take that decision to the D.C. Circuit gotcha. on appeal. So standing, well, Sam and I, of course, are are very sympathetic with you about standing because we at IJ deal with that all the time about these types of injuries. Um, the it seemed to me that the kind of the uh, likelihood that your that the the result of the case would be redressable for your clients was a pretty I don't know, extreme uh, application of that standard. Whereas it's, I th it's usually like, you know, is it plausibly going to fix what you're asking about? 
Um, and it seems like you put forward a very plausible story. It's just that we don't know all the nuts and bolts yet, but you don't have to know all the nut, nuts and bolts at the be at the beginning of, of your case. Uh, I mean, is that some of some of your response to to the decision? Yeah, that's a lot of how we're looking at it. The Supreme Court itself has ruled you don't have to prove what the world would be in this counterfactual situation where the agency actually does follow the law. That's not your obligation in proving standing. So we tried to tell the judges that, like, we don't have to prove what the Census Bureau would actually do and what would actually happen when the Census Bureau actually does its actual job. And uh, because we don't know. And no one can know. It's an unknowable thing. And that's not, you know, that's pretty typical, actually, in malapportionment cases, because even when you're saying, oh, you know, we got in, we, we were injured by this racial discrimination, we're injured by one person, one vote, the, you, you still can't prove that at the end of the state's process for reapportioning seats among the states or the city's process or whatever process you have, that it's actually going to fix it. Like, you don't know what then they're going to do and whether they might cause a different injury or the same injury because it's a process and you can't predict the end of the process. So we think that that's a pretty aggressive reading of standing by the court. The Supreme Court in 1967 said, you know, as long as you throw up some possibility, some idea of how you think it's a, it, it, would, it could result, like we're going to give you standing, even if it, that might not be the right one. So we think that's a pretty good case for us. And then when you talk about procedural injury in, uh, in the Massachusetts v. EPA case, the Supreme Court said, if there is some possibility that the agency could make a process, could you know, complete a process that could actually fix your injury, then we're going to make them go do it. And so we think we proved that there's some possibility because we did all this math. We showed literally, you know, by the numbers from the Census Bureau itself, two possibilities, really three possibilities that could result in benefits to our to our members. So we think that in both of those ways, we've kind of proven uh, redressability and proven injury and proven that this process could actually help us. Can I, can I ask a question? This, this is all very interesting. I was about to say, Sam, any, any questions you have? Yeah. So I, I read the Judge Walker's opinion. And as I understood it, he was kind of saying, you know, you're complaining about a malapportionment in Wisconsin specifically, and you can't show that fixing that specific apportionment would benefit like New York specifically or Pennsylvania specifically, or like the four states whose, whose members uh, your members live in. I think that I think that's right. And I was wondering, you know, even under um, the the panel's kind of view of standing, like, would you kind of be able to get into court if you had an association with members from each of the 50 states? And you kind of go in and you say, yeah, we know we don't know exactly which state is going to benefit from the re the reapportionment from the reapportionment penalty. Um, but if we're taking if we're taking one state away from Wisconsin, we know it's going to one of these other 49 states. <laughs> and we have a member from each of those 49 states in our in our association. And so someone, one of these 50 folks has standing and sure the other 49 might all or other 48 might just kind of have a you know psychic interest, but all you need is one guy with standing. So I don't know. I was just kind of wondering if that was one way to Obviously, you have your arguments about why that decision is just wrong on its face. But I'm also wondering if even if, you know, it were upheld, is there just a, you just need to add a few more people to your association and that kind of addresses the concern that they had? I don't know. That's a, an excellent question. It's the question, question I believe Judge Pan asked at the hearing. You know, why don't you get somebody from all the states? And uh, I think if we got we'd have to have them from at least from the 49 states. I think we couldn't have them from Wisconsin because they would be actually the ones that we'd be taking it from. Uh, and, it, you know, when you have that large of a class with all the states, uh, I, I think that there's there's a question on whether that is individualized injury. Uh, and I, I don't know. Um, but for us, you know, for us, we're saying, like, this is individualized. Like, this is not an injury in common to everybody throughout the United States. And as you guys both know, you know, if, if there is an injury like a ta like taxpayers, like, oh, you know, there's the United States is spending too much money on this or that or the other thing. Like, that's not an injury to a particular person. It's kind of like a too broad base of an injury. And the courts say, well, you know, that doesn't really um, see why you're going to get any benefit from this. You know, if it's three hundred twenty five million dollars, like I don't even think you're going to get a dollar out of it. But when we have our particular states that we think could get new seats, we think that's a really good position to bring the standing argument from. And then when you look at New York in particular, they 
only need 86 more seats. People. And they would get another People. seat. Yeah. People. Thank you. Yes. So I, I think that that's, you know, if there is a possibility that any state is going to get it, it's going to be New York that gets another one. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a great point, Jared. Um, that's what I was wondering is like, you know, 87. So how does what that work? If it's just Wisconsin, you're worried about, would you need 87 times 49 or whatever, you know, however it works or minus. And to tell you the truth, it kind of makes my head hurt to think through that math, which makes me think you're within the zone of plausibility for standing. If, you know, it's, if you need to go through kind of, you know, what a normal lawsuit would do, go and figure out the evidence and then figure out what the merits is, um, you're in the standing zone. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, when you talk about injury in particular, you know, if you're a tort plaintiff, you're a slip and fall or something, you don't have to come to court and prove the damages first before you get into court. You just need to show right. that there's like a possibility that, that this will turn out in your favor. So more big picture, maybe pulling back before we we we, we finish the section two. I understand Congress, right, as part of washing its hands of reconstruction uh, after 1870, they never did anything with Section 2, right, uh, along with a lot of other stuff in the 14th Amendment for a long time, at least. But ha has anyone else ever tried that? Like ever, any, not not just like plaintiff's lawyers, have any states tried to do anything with Section 2? Or is it just like no one did anything, you know, legally with it until your case came along? Oh, people have tried over time. Uh, okay. Not, not very much recently. So the... The last major organization to do this was the NAACP that sued in 1965 here in the District of Columbia as well. And in, in that case, they sought mostly declaratory relief. And, uh, you know, the interesting side story of this, if I could give you that first, yeah. I thought, you know, that's been a while. Like if you're 40 and you're an attorney and it's 1965, like you're like 100 years old now. And so I didn't think that there would be any attorneys who would be alive from that case. But it turns out Michael Meltzner litigated this case on behalf of the NAACP in 1965. And then he ended up teaching law at Northeastern for decades. And I got to meet him, which was really an amazing experience. Wow. And he had all sorts of great advice for me. So at that point, uh, just to get back to the case, they, they threw it out. They said, look, there's Congress just passed a Voting Rights Act. Like, it's 1965. Like, they just, it's 1966. They just passed it. Like, why don't we see how that goes along first? And then, you know, we think this 14th Amendment thing is, is serious. And we, we think it means what it means. But uh, until you come in and prove some actual abridgments, which you guys haven't done, we don't think that this is really the right time for it. So let's see how this, you know, plays out. And we're going to put this on the, we're going to table this for a minute. So then there is also another another gentleman, uh, this guy named Victor Shero, and he litigated this case, this uh, part of the Constitution a few times. The first time the Census Bureau came, he, he thought the uh, he thought the Section two of the 14th Amendment required the Census Bureau to put a question on the Census Bureau questionnaire that they send out to everybody and say, were your votes denied or abridged this year? And you can say yes or no. So then. I, I don't I don't know that it requires that, but that was his position. And so when the Census Bureau came knocking at his door, he said, I'm not answering this. I think it's unconstitutional. And I want you guys to uh, arrest me or something so that I can have standing <laughs> to bring this case in court. <laughs> and, and, and they did. And the uh, they, they ruled against him then. And he brought uh -huh. a couple more cases. And that that actually led to this 1971 decision. And that's what this three judge court was relying on quite a bit because the 1971 decision was a lot similar to the one that, that I was the, the decision that came out from the three judge court where they said, you need to go out and do the census bureau's job first. And then when you're done with that, come back to us. And uh, so they threw that out as well, but that, that, you know, that was, you know, still another 50 years ago and the laws evolved since then and become more precise on procedural injury to become a lot more precise mm -hmm. on standing. And so we don't think that that's still good law. And that was kind of the last, that's the last real one that I've seen. There's, uh, you know, some other pro se people who brought these cases and, and things like that uh -huh. that are a little less refined. 
So you're kind of threading the needle through, uh, through all those uh, past past efforts. It it sounds like. Yeah, trying to distinguish them and and show how they how they fit into the the broader scheme and and making sure that all the pieces stand together. I think that that we do thread all of the needle. I think pretty solidly. I think administrative law and procedural law have come a long way, and I think that they're all pretty much in our favor at this point. Well, we will look forward to when that uh, opinion uh, is argued and comes out at the DC circuit. And uh, we, uh, we, we will um, perhaps have you back on the podcast when we, uh, we get an update of, uh, about that case. So thank you so much for the uh, story of section two of the 14th amendment and um, how to put that case together. Another case that came together in a very different way um, and that, frankly, I did not pay too much attention to, came from the Second Circuit, but Sam has read it, and it has a very interesting footnote four. Um, and it has to do with unpublished opinions. Now, these are opinions that uh, usually you don't think are precedent, so because they're not, quote, published, they're not like, quote, law, they may be something you point a court in a right direction to, but it turns out, um, at least in the Second Circuit, that they actually are law, which was news to me. So Sam, uh, what's up with this footnote for? Um, it's a pretty exciting footnote, Anthony. Thank you for uh, <laughs> giving me the opportunity to, to talk about it. Um, so I, let's give a little bit of background because there's a lot of moving parts in this case and we're blessedly not going to talk about most of them, but I think it, it might be useful to kind of give a, give a bit of scene setting. Um, so the case involves a gentleman who apparently sold a lot of drugs. Uh, to retail drug dealers in a place called Greece, New York, which is near Rochester. And since we're talking about kind of footnote esoterica, I'll also, if I may, Anthony, um, talk about some totally Please. unrelated esoterica. Um, I was reading this opinion last night and that the name Greece, New York really stuck out to me as kind of a, an interesting name for a town near Rochester, New York. And I had my hunch about what was going on, but I went on Wikipedia and confirmed it, uh, which is that the town was founded in the 1820s. Uh, at the height of the Greek War of Independence against the Ottoman Empire. And, oh. you know, folks in England and apparently in America, too, were really excited about the Greek War of Independence. And so that's why they named the town of Greece, Greece. Um, it is also, uh, for your Michigan listeners, why uh, Ypsilanti is, is called Ypsilanti. He was a famous Greek general uh, in the, the Greek War of Independence. Um, so I thought that was Do pretty... you know if there's like a... Also, do you know if there's like a statue or a street named uh, for Lord Byron? Um, I, you know, he was a huge fan I do, of the Greek War of Independence. Well, he was uh, to, to kind of to his cost. And that, that, that raises another even more tangential point, which is this. Um, so I studied abroad in Greece in college um, on the island of Rhodes. That's uh, where I met my wife, in fact, um, who was also mm -hmm. studying abroad. She wasn't. She's not from Greece. But um, a friend and I uh, went to visit Turkey. Uh, southern Turkey for one weekend, and we happened upon this British expat bar and had a great time with a bunch of British expats. And there was this relatively elderly lady who um, told us that she is a descendant of an illegitimate child of Lord Byron. And I, I don't know if it was wow. true. I have no reason to doubt her. She gave me like a little picture of Lord Byron, which she was she was carrying. Um, it wasn't like an oil painting. It was like a picture postcard that she had, and I still have it somewhere. <laughs> Um, so anyway, it, I know it was, it was all pretty interesting. So that was the first sentence of this, the second circuit opinion had to do with Greece, New York. But, but anyway, um, I have to interrupt you again though, Sam, because I, I knew this was coming to me. I just had to look it up about what state it was in. Town of Greece is also the, uh, the, the, um, first amendment case about using chaplains for, opening prayer at city council meetings. Yes, that's right, from a few years ago. Which was uh, 30 years ago, I guess, uh, was now, it? that 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 case. Oh, no, okay. I'm sorry, 10 years ago. Okay, yeah, well. Apologize. No. Yeah. So there's a lot yeah. going on in Greece, New York. Yeah, a lot, lot of fun things. Um, so anyway, this guy got a life sentence for um, engaging in what's called a continuing criminal enterprise. Um, and there's a lot of procedurally kind of strange things going on. But basically, to kind of cut through the undergrowth a bit, there's a statute, a federal statute, saying that if you're uh, if you're in a criminal enterprise and one of your crimes involves 150 kilos of cocaine or more, then you get life in prison. 
And the evidence here shows that this gentleman did a lot of crimes and they involved a lot of drugs. And at trial, uh, what the district court did, though, was instruct the jury that they could aggregate all of his drugs over all of those crimes to get over that 150 kilo threshold um, rather than finding that one specific crime involved more than 150 kilos. Um, so the jury convicts him. And then for the first time on appeal, the defendant contends that this this was uh, you know a misreading of the statute and that to trigger that enhanced life sentence, the jury needs to find that one specific felony involved 150 kilos or more of the drugs. Uh, you can't aggregate a bunch of smaller crimes. Uh, now, because he raises this for the first time, of course, it's subject to plain error review, which means that the Court of Appeals has to determine not just whether there was an error, uh, as they would have to do for any issue raised on appeal, but also whether that error was obvious. And on top of that, whether the error actually affected the outcome of the trial. It's, it's a pretty high, I think it's like a four-step analysis uh, in order to prevail on plain error review. And here's where things get kind of weird, and I promise we're getting to footnote four, Anthony, um, because the, the lead judge, who's Judge Menashe, uh, says that the error here with the aggregate versus you know whether we're, we're looking at the 150 kilos in a specific crime, it didn't actually affect this defendant's rights. It didn't affect the outcome of his trial because even if the jury had been properly instructed, there was just a ton of evidence that he, in fact, did do individual crimes involving more than 150 kilos of cocaine. So that is enough to kill the entire argument on plain error review. Uh, we kind of we could all go home. Uh, but then for good measure, the, the judge says that just by the way, the error also w was an error and it was a pretty obvious error. So he's just kind of going, venturing beyond the one thing he needs to decide to resolve this issue and, and addressing kind of the merits. And, and that's kind of a strange thing to do um, since it doesn't actually affect the outcome of the appeal, right? You know, if a defendant has to show two things to win and the court says, well, you haven't shown one of those two things, then there's typically no reason to go on and start talking about the other thing um, because it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop a lot of judges from doing stuff like that. Though. Not necessarily. A um, couple though, Seventh Circuit judges come to mind. Perhaps. Some perhaps. listeners may know about. Yeah. Um, well, one of Judge Menashe's colleagues, Judge Bianchi, I know, did uh, kind of mention that this was not the normal way of doing business. Um but in any event, you know, Judge Menashe uh, addresses the, the plain error merits question anyway, and, and that in itself is a little bit weird. Uh, but then he says that the error is obvious, which is, again, one of the elements of, of plain error review. And in doing that, he cites this non-precedential order from the, the late 1990s. And, and you know, Judge Bianco, um, I think I may have mispronounced his name just before, so apologies um, to the, the Second Circuit folks listening to you. Um, he starts saying, you know, what's going on here? You know, we're not supposed to be talking about this issue anyway because this guy loses regardless. And even if we are talking about it, how can we possibly say that an error is you know, obvious and manifest and plain when to do that we have to point to a non-precedential unpublished order from 20 years ago that nobody cited at any point over the life of this case? And that that's where we kind of get to this, this tricky question about you know, what kind of status do these unpublished non-precedential orders have? Because Judge Menashe's response is, sure, it's non-precedential, but we can only issue orders in a non-precedential fashion when the rules of law we're articulating are super obvious. Like that That's the reason why we get to do this shortcut and not publish them, because they're not adding to the development of the law in any way, because it's just, you know, re-articulating an already obvious proposition. So, so actually, non-presidential orders suggest that the, the issues being discussed are more obvious, uh, potentially, than if you see them raised in presidential orders, um, which, I don't know, I think, Anthony, you, you, should, you had some skepticism about that when we were emailing back and forth about it, but it strikes me as kind of a good point. Um, I mean, if, if the premise of not having to publish, you know, an opinion is that it doesn't actually add anything new and everything's obvious and settled, then that does kind of suggest that these are pretty obvious and settled propositions, and it is, I think, in tension with um, like various other parts of the law, right? Like my sense is that if you're in, the, in you know, a qualified immunity case, for example, I, I haven't done a deep dive in this, but my hunch is that um, there are probably courts out there that have said that law cannot be clearly established if you're relying on unpublished precedent. But then if you look at you know, Judge Menashe's reasoning, it suggests that maybe, it, maybe it's extra uh, clearly established if it's huh. uh, you know, so settled that it can be an unpublished precedent. Um, so all in all, it's a pretty uh, pretty strange opinion. There were three different opinions from each of the different panel members. Um, and yeah, you know, as far as footnotes four go, pretty exciting. Um, up there with Caroline products. And, uh, you know, I definitely, definitely recommend it to the readers. 
Uh, Jared, are, are you are you a fan of unpublished opinions? I'm not a fan. I think court opinions are precedent, and I think that that's what we pay judges to do. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. That is the common law tradition, and I think that's also how we enforce equal protection by making sure that everyone who is in the same situation is treated the same. And so when judges issue these non-presidential decisions, generally, I've always thought that they were a kind of not completing their duties. And when they start using it for things that they, they are not supposed to be doing, then that, that strikes me as, um, as, as kind of a, a flaw in the, in the process. So what, what did, what's your take on, on memorandum? Well, I, I, I basically agree with you. Um, I think this one was doubly strange because it says, look, the fact that it was unpublished before means it was super obvious, which I get that. That's not a weird thing to say, but it's obviously not super obvious to the three judges on this court because they're disagreeing with that. So how are you like, so so doesn't that undercut the fact that it actually was obvious in the first place? So you know it's like circular reasoning if you see what I mean. You're saying, well, this can't be uh this can't be questionable because it was an unpublished opinion it would only be an unpublished opinion if it wasn't questionable and therefore it's not questionable. Like it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Which which goes to, you know, my agreement with you Jared that I've always thought unpublished opinions uh are a little hooey. Because um, the whole point of having precedent is that it accumulates, you know, over the time, and, and that there is this old-fashioned notion that the precedent is only um, evidence of the law. It itself is not law because judges aren't writing statutes; they're writing opinions, and so you know the law is just kind of somewhere in the background. It's like an abstract of it, and so if you have unpublished opinions, then you have the judges doing stuff that doesn't accumulate that doesn't isn't part of the law, although now I guess it's it's just law that's super obvious. Um, so anyway, I have problems with that. I have problems, like a lot of other courts really don't look at unpublished opinions this way. They do look at like, that was just a one-off. You could cite it maybe, but like, we're not going to follow it in any way. I, I know that some state courts of appeals think of unpublished opinions that way. Um, and so for a federal court to be saying this, this way is odd. The, the another thing is, you know, before I think it was 2007, you couldn't even cite unpublished opinions. This this was issued before then. Um, it, it, you you then then they made the rule I think to be more reasonable that yeah you can cite them. It's just they're not binding precedent. Um, some states I think still have that rule for intermediate courts of appeals. So um, that the the only benefit I think and I mean I think Jared and I you saw this when we were clerking. Sam, I bet you saw it when you were clerking. The benefit of unpublished opinions is then the judge can say, this is unpublished. We're not going to put a lot of work in it. And so then you can you know, get it out the door a lot faster. Uh, and there's certain internal procedures where not as many judges have to worry about it. And I think judges really like that because they're only human. But I don't think it's good for the law. I don't know. Like, I, I have more sympathy I think than you guys do, like particularly, uh, you know, I'll use pro se appellants as an example, but if you have like a pro se appeal or even like a, a counseled appeal that is just kind of very badly litigated, um, you know, that I think raises the possibility that because the judges aren't being kind of like well-informed by the, the parties in the law, that there's more of a likelihood for, for errors just in the process. And so to the extent that that is one of the considerations on whether or not you publish or unpublish, the idea being like, well, kind of like, you know, garbage in from the parties, you know, we don't want to have garbage out being precedential. Um, I mean, the answer to that, of course, is that the judges should, should try to get it right. But realistically, I, I could, I would not be surprised if that might be one of the factors that goes into deciding it. So I don't know, just to be contrary. Well, I, want, I wonder if the trade-off, well, that that is a good point, Sam, but I wonder if trade-off of that is that in the modern age, we take precedent as too precedential. And there is this understanding, at least a little older in the common law, that um, you know, precedent, because it accumulates and creates precedent, anyone, just because you have a latest case doesn't mean that absolutely is binding if it kind of doesn't, you know, if you can, especially if you could show, well, that, you know, that was like a one page order from a pro se appellant. 
that raises all kinds of other questions about, you know, judges just bucking the law and, and what kind of system you'd have and it would be all chaos. And we don't have to figure all that out today, but um, I think there are some, there's some pros and cons there. Well, thank you for those pros and cons though, Sam, that was, that was very well done. And uh, I appreciate learning more about the town of Greece. Jared, thank you for coming on. And I forgot to say earlier, there is a, there was a, a long, really interesting article in Politico last year that talked about Jared's case and uh, more broadly about the 14th Amendment. And so we'll put a link up in the show notes to, to that. You guys can can check it out. Uh, kind of portrays uh, Jared as this uh, like cowboy walking in the town about the clean up justice, some justice. Um, which was uh, which was fun to see. So um, you can check out that. We'll put some other um, authorities in the in the show note if show notes if people want to learn a bit a little bit more. But in the meantime, I want everybody to get engaged. Mm-hmm.